Hello and welcome to the third part of Lecture 5 on this course on Chemical Process Design. This part of Lecture 5 will examine column instrumentation and control strategies. In terms of instrumentation, we want to be able to quickly judge whether or not the column is operating to give the desired specification. Automated analysis systems will often not give sufficiently accurate information sufficiently quickly enough for the purposes of column control. It is therefore usual to infer the composition of distillation products by examining the temperature profile of a distillation column and comparing this to the temperature profile for a datum that is known working. With regard to control, we wish to be able to stably control a distillation column at steady state and we will examine two control philosophies that allow us to do this, material balance control and energy balance control. So. In this part of this lecture, I want to try and answer these two questions on the whiteboard. How can distillate and residue composition be quickly inferred? And what control scheme best suits a given column for its operation? So here on the whiteboard as well, there's a sketch diagram of one particular column control configuration. And that's one that we're going to be talking about at a later point in this part of this lecture. So let's start at the beginning. How do we figure out what our column's doing? The key problem is this, is that automated analysis equipment usually takes time to come to a result, even if you can find analysis equipment for the chemical species that you've got. Very often, the amount of time taken is going to be too slow for control to be used from that. So, automated analysis equipment, very good for quality assurance. Laboratory testing, very good for quality assurance. Neither of these are very good for column control. So we have to do something different. What we do instead is we infer compositions from a measurement that we can quickly and easily take. Now for many hydrocarbon systems and for many other systems as well, we will typically know what chemical species we have and we will have already, through our design process, obtained a validated thermodynamic model for that mixture of species. So if we know the column temperature profile and the column pressure, along with our thermodynamic model, we can figure out what compositions therefore correspond to that. So we're going to control our column composition by looking at temperatures. And deviations in temperature will therefore mean deviations in column composition. So what we want to be able to do is to quickly and accurately infer changes in temperature for our distillation column. And so we need to find out where in our distillation column the most sensitive point to measure temperature is going to be. And again, at the design stage, we can do this by multiple simulation studies. So let's establish a workflow. The first thing we're going to do is to figure out what our datum case is. From the last part of this lecture, we've already got a datum for our particular example. We know the number of feeds, we know the number of stages, we know where we're putting the feed stage, we've got some idea about feed preheat, and we know our column pressure. So for our datum case, we're going to run our simulation again, and we're going to record the temperature profile of the column. We're going to look at each of the tray temperatures. Then what we're going to do is we're going to change things. We're going to increase and decrease the amount of reflux that's going into the column. We're going to increase and decrease the distillate flow rate. We're going to change our product specifications. And for each one of these different scenarios, we're again going to note the temperature profile. With these data, what we're going to do is to plot something called temperature deviation. Temperature deviation in this instance means the temperature profile of one of these alternate cases minus the temperature profile of my datum. We will quickly see when we plot temperature deviation that there are going to be points in the distillation column that have a broader deviation than others. And of course, it's these points where we get the largest temperature swing. We want to be able to measure temperature. And so this is why at the design stage it's a very, very useful thing to do because we can design in where we're putting our thermo wells. Let's plot out some data so you can see this firsthand. So on the y-axis of this graph, I'm plotting my temperature deviation. Zero on this axis means I'm just operating identically to my base case. Any deviation away from that, therefore, is a change in the operation of the column. On the x-axis, I'm plotting the column stage. Stage 1 is the condenser. The final stage, in this case 30, is the reboiler. So I'm going to run a couple of cases where I'm going to change the heavy key specification, the distillate, and then the light key specification in the residue. And for each of these cases, we'll start to figure out why we're seeing the deviations we're observing. 
And then hopefully that information can start to also build into your mental model of how these systems work. So let's start by changing the heavy key in the distillate. If you think what this means, it means we're putting a different proportion of less volatile component of a higher condensing temperature component into the condenser. And so this solid red line here is an increase of my heavy key by 10%. So I'm putting more of my component that condenses at a higher temperature into the condenser. So therefore the top bit of the column is going to warm up and we can clearly see the bottom part of the column isn't really affected. Correspondingly, if we reduce the amount of heavy key in the distillate, then all the species in the condenser are going to condense at lower temperatures. We haven't got one of these high temperature condensing components there. So therefore in the top of the column, we'll see that my temperature falls. Likewise, if we now change the light key in the residue, if we think what this means, the light key has a condensing temperature that is low. So if we're putting more of that species that condenses at a lower temperature into the base of the column and hence into the reboiler, we'll see the temperature in the bottom of the column start to drop. If, however, we reduce the amount of light key going into the residue, we will, of course, see the opposite happen. The temperature in the base of the column will start to rise. And so we can figure out why we see these temperature deviations with a little bit of thought, and it's all rather logical. What we also see is that at various points in both the rectifying section and the stripping section, we've got a bigger temperature deviation compared to anywhere else. And so looking at these data, it might be appropriate with this information to say, well, let's start to think about measuring temperature deviations at tray 6 for the top of the column and at tray 24 for the bottom of the column, because this is where our largest temperature swings are, which means that it's going to be easier to measure those temperature changes and get a fast result with which we can use to control specifications of composition. OK, so that's changing light key and heavy key. Let's change some other stuff and see what happens. So let's change reflux ratio next. And let's start off by thinking about a increase in reflux ratio. And let's again think what this means. If I'm increasing my reflux ratio, that means a greater amount of cool material is being put back into the top of the column. And so therefore, I would expect the top of the column to cool down. And we can see that quite clearly because there's a temperature drop in the top half of the column. If we think what happens to that reflux, it goes down the column and eventually hits the reboiler. But in order now to keep the uh, distillate and residue specifications the same, the reboiler's got to work harder. We've got to put more energy into the reboiler to boil that extra reflux. And so we might expect the base of the column to heat up a bit. And that's what we can see. So increasing reflux ratio decreases the temperature in the top of the column, increases the temperature in the base of the column. And the opposite also applies. If we're putting less cool material back into the top of the column, we'd expect the top of the column to be warmer. And likewise, we're not having to boil up quite so much in the base of the column. And so the base of the column will start to drop in temperature touch as well. We can also vary our product streams. So if we vary my distillate flow rate, then again, we're going to see temperature swings. OK, so I've plotted these data on this graph. The vertical red dashed lines correspond to those trays 6 and 24 that we established as being most sensitive for changes in heavy key and light key specification. And we can see that tray 6 is still the most sensitive tray for changes in reflux ratio and changes in distillate composition, presumably because as we change each of these quantities, we're also changing the heavy key and the light key in the top of the column. If we look at the base of the column, tray 24 was our original specification for heavy key and light key changes. Um, it's not doing too bad a job. We might want to put an additional thermowell in, perhaps. I mean, thermowells aren't going to be hugely expensive to manufacture and install. So maybe we might also have some control information coming from stage 21 as well. So we can very, very clearly communicate now to other people within the engineering team the exact effect of changing these column specifications on the temperature profile. And we've had to do a, quite a large number of simulation runs to do this. And this is actually a very effective way to communicate the results from that large number of simulation runs. So let's turn our attention now to that second question. How do we control our column 
for the given scenario our column is operating in. So let's talk about the first of these two schemes. Let's talk about material balance schemes. So material balance schemes attempt to maintain a constant inventory within the process, hence their name of a material balance scheme. The way they do this is to control the liquid levels in the column sump and in the reflux drum. Now remember, in the base of a distillation column, you have liquid holdup. That liquid holdup is called a sump, and you typically have maybe five, six, seven minutes worth of holdup under normal flow conditions in the base of your column. We'll discuss more about this in the mechanical design aspects in the final part of this lecture. So that is one level you can control, and your reflux drum level is the other level you can control. So if we're electing to use a material balance scheme, we need to figure out which flow should each level controller manipulate, how that flow controller operates, and also should level controllers be cascaded onto flow controllers or should they act directly on to the valves themselves. So this is usually a conversation that's carried out with the control specialist, but if we've got small distillate flow rates we might have a scheme such as this. Let's talk this through. In the top of the column I have my reflux drum. So there we have V-1-120 is my reflux drum, and I'm looking at the level in that drum to start with. So my level control here is cascaded onto the flow controller for the reflux. If we're acknowledging a small distillate flow rate, we've probably got a substantial reflux flow rate, and so therefore manipulating the reflux would be the more sensitive thing to do. The reflux ratio is maintained by the flow control on the distillate, and there would be a ratio control between the two flow controllers, reflux flow and distillate flow that's not marked on this diagram. So the active control from the level goes onto the reflux. Information on reflux flow is then used to establish what the reflux ratio is, which controls the flow controller on the distillate. In the base of the column, we have level control on the column sump, directly going on to the flow controller that will control the residue flow out of the column. And so there we have the material balance scheme for a small distillate flow. If we've got a large distillate flow, we don't change what's happening in the base of the column at all. We keep the level control on the sump cascaded onto the residue flow rate. The red box here, dashed red box, is what has changed. If we've got a large distillate flow rate, we simply swap the control onto the flow that's going to be the most sensitive to control. And in this case, the larger flow is going to be the easiest to control. And so now I have my level controller for my reflux drum cascaded onto my flow controller for the distillate outlet. And the reflux ratio now is set by knowledge of that distillate flow with the flow controller for the reflux return operating on whatever that ratio is going to be elected to be set to. So those are two different material balance schemes. If we think about energy balance schemes, what is it that we control? Well, the way to answer that question is to look at the energy balance of the entire column, and that's what I've put on the board here. If we think about the entire column energy balance, what we have is energy coming in in all the feeds and in the reboiler, much as we discussed when we were talking about feed preheat. Your feed coming in and your reboiler are your sources of energy. And then you're extracting energy in your condenser, in all the product streams that leave the column, and, of course, if you've got any heat loss, that is also contributing to energy extraction. So here is my column energy balance. So an energy balance scheme will control the easiest one or two of these energy inputs or removals. Now, realistically, condenser duty is going to be the easiest to control. Sometimes, however, you can also control reboiler duty. So those are going to be the two things that you control on an energy balance scheme. If we go for control of a condenser, you might control the condensation rate. You might also control the rate at which vapour actually leaves the column as well. If we're thinking about reboiler energy balance control, you'll control the vapour generation rate, typically by the supply of the hot utility to it, usually steam. So let's illustrate a simple energy balance scheme. Now, the top of the column is unchanged from the previous material balance scheme. We've got level control on the reflux drum, and that's cascading onto the flow control to the distillate leaving the process. So we're leaving that alone. What we've changed is we've put energy balance control on the base of the column. 
if you have a look at where the level controller for the sump now cascades onto is for the flow control of the steam into the reboiler. And so if we wish to remove more material from the system, then we will change that steam flow rate to allow us to do that. OK, let's recap a few key points. So if we're thinking about inferring specification, we're doing this via temperature. So therefore, temperature indicators should be placed at points on the column where maximum temperature deviation away from the datum is expected. These locations can be revealed by running successive simulation cases and by compiling the data together and looking at it graphically. We looked at two different control schemes. We looked at material balance control. A material balance control aims to keep a constant inventory of material within a distillation process and controls liquid levels in the column sump and in the reflux drum to achieve that. We also looked very briefly at energy balance control. An energy balance control regulates the energy input into a distillation process, either by manipulating the condenser or the reboiler.